Today is January 25th, 2022, and my guest is venture capitalist and author Michael Eisenberg. He is the co-founder of the venture capital fund Aleph here in Israel. That's A-L-E-P-H in English, Aleph here in Israel. And his latest book is The Tree of Life and Prosperity, Ethical, Economic, and Business Principles from Genesis to the 21st Century. Michael, wel- Michael welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. Great to see you. And just to let our listeners know, we're going to be talking about venture capital investing in a small market like Israel, Israeli economic issues. And uh, I think we'll also get to eventually, uh, by the end of the conversation, get to talk about what we can learn from the book of Genesis. Now, despite your appearance on the YouTube version of this conversation, where you look to be about 26 years old, somehow you have been a venture capitalist for almost 30 years, uh, defying uh age, it appears. Uh, what's your philosophy of investment? W- what motivates you? And how do you think about uh, where, to, where to put the, the money you're entrusted with and that's your own? Yeah, uh, great question. And thank you for the compliment of my parents' genetics. Yeah. Um, so, and, and maybe of my wife keeping me young. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I have to divide between the beginning of my career and and kind of what I've learned over 25 or 27 years at this business. When I was getting started, I didn't have any philosophy of investment for what it's worth. Uh, I like to say that I do before I think, which is sometimes dangerous, but but oftentimes has, has some upsides. And so uh, I just went where there was open white space, which was the internet. In 1995 in Israel, there were very, very few people who knew anything about the internet. And I was fortunate enough that in college, I got exposed to it. And so... I guess I was an early investor uh, in the internet. But um, the most important thing I learned about investing is that it's about networking. And you got to know a lot of people and see a lot of deals and, you know, be be trusted in a way uh, that money trusts you and founders trust you and investors trust you. Um, And so the core of my investment philosophy starts with people. Uh, I want to invest in special kinds of people. I want to network and develop relationships uh, with other investors and uh, people in, in corporations and, and founders and interesting technologists. And that's how I see deal flow. And that's how we move these companies ahead. And then you build management teams the same way. So that's at the core of the philosophy. More recently, and I've penned a couple of blogs about this, uh, apparently some article today in the Hebrew press, which I haven't seen, they called me a bit of a loud mouth for expressing my opinions on blogs. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I said was that I, I'm long humanity. And I think we're, we're in a turning point uh, this is already true a few years ago, um, where uh, I want to invest in products and innovations which empower uh, other human beings to be successful economically and realign business in a way that wasn't previously aligned. This is not for whatever it's worth, some ESG or Kumbaya or anything like that. This has to be core to the business model uh, of it. And I've tried to do more and more of that over the last uh, bunch of years, and that's that's become a big theme I've been investing behind. So long on humanity means you, you want to invest and, and you're optimistic. Uh, in short, means you think they're not going to make it. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But I want, I want you to talk about an episode in your book uh, where you talk about the business that you wandered into in 1995 that had this crazy idea about sharing photographs. And it's, uh, it reminded me a little bit. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what the analogy would be. Is it Ben Franklin flying his kite? And I, I just, I can't, it's only 28 or whatever it was, 27 years ago. And it's like, it's ancient times. It's like horse-drawn carriages and uh, the Pony Express. I, I don't know. Talk about it. And, what, and talk about what, it's, what, what it felt like at the time and now looking back on it, how it feels. Well, the, the really strange thing is, to your point, is today this investment feels totally trivial um, <laughs> because things have moved ahead so quickly. Um, in 1995, I was two years uh, having made Aliyah, which is immigrated to Israel, uh, came from New York. Our, our family was was in New York, and I got introduced to a guy named Yaakov Ben Yaakov, um, Jacob, the son of Jacob, translated to English. Uh, um, his parents had a good time with that name, I guess. And uh, he... he I get introduced by a guy who I barely knew and I go see him and he's in his attic in a, in a town just outside of Jerusalem. And he shows me this thing where you could take a negative 
uh, people I assume on the show know what a negative is still. Maybe, but maybe not. not. <laughs> you, you used to put film in cameras. It was like a physical object. Um, and out of that, you take it to a to a one hour Photoshop or a three day Photoshop and they'd make a negative out of it and then print you some pictures. Um, so anyway, you took this negative and you put it in what's called a negative scanner at the time. So everyone knows what a paper scanner is today, but then they had also negative scanners. And um, it would then upload this digitalized, digitized image from the negative onto a computer. And then you could kind of hit send and take a couple of minutes to paint it on another computer screen. Uh, by the way, two feet away, but, you know, it went over the Internet. So maybe it went, you know, 6,000 miles away and then back to the same room in Jerusalem. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. And being the father of a young daughter at the time, uh, a baby and family abroad, you know, man, I can send pictures of my daughter instantaneously, not really, uh, you know, across the Atlantic. That That's amazing. And uh, I thought that'd be an empowering innovation. And that's actually the first investment that I, that I enabled or did. It's more complicated than that. And uh, I learned a huge amount from it. One is everybody said this couldn't be done. Like this was not physically or physics wise possible, you know, to transmit that amount of data over these tiny modems. And so it couldn't be done. And two, the arc of technology is such and the velocity of technology is such that if you get a secular trend to start to build on itself, it accelerates. It's not just Moore's law. It's there will be more bandwidth, there'll be more compute, because people want this to happen and it'll focus a lot of engineering effort on it. For what it's worth, by the way, I think that's true of cryptocurrency today. That's where the bright engineering minds are going to. And so more and more people would get focused on this and, and it would get better. And then Kind of the third lesson was, um, in addition to kind of silly, and this will get better, is uh, stuff that gives human beings uh, a positive emotional response to to a technology get adoption and gets noticed. The press notices it. And I think that matters a lot. One of the underappreciated uh, facets of great entrepreneurship is storytelling. And this was a great story waiting to be told and Yaakov and his partner, Phil and Elliot got a hand on telling the story. And I think that mattered a lot. And particularly in the early days of the internet. And when you're in the early days of an industry in general, now um, being able to tell a story is probably the most important thing an entrepreneur can do, by the way, witness Elon Musk. Yeah. It's funny because I've talked on the program recently about how I got seduced by driverless cars. I also got seduced by Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. I thought, you know, this is – because I'm so long humanity, at least until recently, and I'm getting a little pessimistic. But in general, I'm an optimistic guy, and I love, love, love the human creativity that transforms the world and our lives. And um, when I, I – and, but, but your observation about storytelling is so important because, of course, I knew nothing about driverless cars. I got seduced thinking it's imminent. In a few years, we're going to have – uh, no more driving. All cars will be autonomous. There'll be no more accidents because cars will be able to be sen- use their sensors to talk to each other. We might have smart roads where cars can go 120 miles an hour, equivalent to a train, but linked together but safely. And that'll change how cities are organized. Roads will be narrower. We don't need parking spaces. We'll have fewer cars. We won't be producing as many cars. The workforce will be liberated. The cab- I mean, I had a beautiful story, very much driven by my understanding of economics and the classic economist question of, and then what? And I just kept thinking of all the social and cultural changes. You know, you'd, you'd go to dinner with your wife, and instead of taking a car or a taxi, this thing would show up at your door. You wouldn't have to drive. You'd, you'd have a, a glass of wine on the way to dinner. I mean, there were just so many beautiful stories that I was seduced by that I think you know, without knowing any knowledge of the technology and, and even talking to very smart people on this program, we said, well, you know, it's, the cars don't really think. It's more like they're on a like a train track. <laughs> you know, the Google technology is not that good. And, oh, yeah, but they'll, they'll fix it. They'll just keep working at it. Like you said, they'll keep they'll keep making it better. And, and they will. And they have. But I found I think that storytelling aspect of this is so powerful. And I don't think I've I don't think I appreciated what it, how it spoke to me. As an outsider, I, didn't, I never invested my own money into into a, a driverless car. It'd be a different level of storytelling that would be required. But I think the storytelling aspect of it is incredibly uh, insightful. I, I think one of the interesting things this is something I learned from Gavin Baker, who's a uh, well-known investor, used to be Fidelity now, a firm uh, Atreides. Is one of the differences between being an investor and having to commit capital 
and anything else is you actually have to put it on the line. So you need to test the limits of the story. Um, and not apropos, it doesn't matter if it's driverless cars or something else. You know, anytime you got to take out a, a shovel and, and and move some atoms, it slows everything down dramatically um, and introduces endless complexity into it because there's a lot of people with quote unquote rights of way or, or who are using economic term rent seekers on those atoms. Um, and so uh, I think there's there's a lot of complexity that then gets introduced into the story. And I think that's, by the way, uh, um, one of the differences uh, between what I would call popular media uh, and actually having to, you know, to invest money in it is you've got to be aware of of the limitations, the gotchas, the uh, the reality, the hard realities of uh, of life. That having been said, by the way, because of point one, which is things that sound silly, many of them end up happening. Uh, sometimes, in rare cases, you you need to just suspend the disbelief uh, to get after that. You know, and uh, true. maybe we'll get into the, the kind of the difference between you know risk and unknown at some point in this conversation. That, that's sure, but, that. but that you know that uh, photograph story, which is absolutely absurd. The idea that you could share a image of your child with a loved one across the ocean is a ridiculous idea. It's a ridiculous idea. I mean, it's silly. It's not going to happen. Obviously, it's a somebody's you know. It, it's a it's a it's a scam, for as a way for somebody to take your money, and pretend to invest it in a technology that obviously isn't going to work. And if it does work, I mean, how many people are going to have a modem that's going to be strong enough to 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 do that? And they're going to sit there and wait for minutes after minutes. So you're right. At some point, there is inevitably a story that someone has been suckered into that actually comes true. You know, it reminds me of when I used to put my kids. Makes to, me feel to, like a sucker now. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll say you're like a friar, a, a word that came up in a recent conversation with Tyler Cow and a word from an Israeli word. There was a dispute over whether it's Russian. I just assumed it was Yiddish. Do you know? I don't. I just know it means a sucker. Yeah, okay. So, and you don't want to be one. Oh, boy. Uh, but I used to put, put my kids to bed every night with my wife. And, and you know, one of them would say, oh, Daddy, tell me a story. Tell me a story. We'd usually tell them a story, read them a book. There's a whole uh, – uh, routine, and I'd say, okay, here's the story. Once upon a time, there was a little boy, and he was uh, he went out, and he was really strong, and uh, then he then he came back home and he went to sleep. Oh, Dad, come on, that's not a, that's a story. So I think you know you're you're. And they wanted a real story, and I think this distinction between let's call it a bedtime story, which is driverless cars are going to change the world. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I'm going to think about that. Versus you have to put. X percent of your life savings behind this idea that this person's telling you. And, and when that person says driverless cars are going to change the world, you probably should say, you better tell me the full version, not that little quick bedtime story version. Part of what I try to do in this is, is, is what I call backcasting, um, which is the inverse of forecasting, which is I, I like to imagine that driverless car world and then ask, OK, what do we need to do in order to get there? And what's in control? What's out of control? What needs to go right? Uh, along the way in order to get there. And I find that's kind of a useful framework for how you figure out whether uh, this new story or vision of the world um, has an option happening. I, my, my partner at Benchmark, Bruce and Levy, used to say that the venture business needs to ask the question of what can go right. And if this goes right and that goes right and that goes right and that goes right, well, then we've got a big outcome. The odds of each one of those going right is like 5%. Um, but you want to check to make sure there aren't blockers on the way that are kind of immovable or that something doesn't elongate the steps so much that you can't topple the domino uh, on the way to what can go right and what can go right and what can go right. And so uh, I think that, that those are kind of my frameworks I use for, for getting after this. This backcasting and kind of looking at that and going, if this goes right and that goes right, then how do we get there? By the way, and that, I, I haven't bought an autonomous vehicles. You say that again? I, I haven't bought into autonomous vehicles because I don't think we'll get there. For a long okay. period of time. Okay, As I was going to ask you. That's 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 great. But you know, you you alluded to rent seekers and rent seeking earlier, and obviously one of the challenges which you don't want to see is that kind of barrier. That the idea that someone might regulate your innovation out of the marketplace before it has a chance to be tested by the customer instead is ruled out of bounds, is vetoed by government regulation, is obviously a disaster. And I think one of the challenges, uh, you know, we're, you and I both now live in a country, Israel, that has a, a socialist past, a very strong socialist past, where the 
general outlook is uh, you ask for permission, not forgiveness. And yet somehow the Israeli venture scene and the startup scene is extraordinary. Do you find that strange? There's so many parts of this economy where you not only have to ask for permission, you've got to ask for permission more than once, maybe you know, five or six times in different government offices. And yet there's something magical that's happened here uh, startup-wise. Uh, talk about that cultural seemingly seeming disconnect. Yeah. I actually have a slightly different perspective on that, um, meaning factually everything you said I think is correct, which is Israel has uh, a lot of what I would call bureaucratic regulations and hoops you need to run through to get a lot of things uh, permitted. But um, most of Israeli innovation and the startup scene comes out of the military. And ironically, we have the least hierarchical military, I think, in the planet where kind of anyone can kind of speak up. And if you're 22, you're, you know, forget that. When you're 20, you're commanding other people um, and expected to speak up to your commanders. I, I teach some courses in the military here. I see it live um, where kind of more junior folks in the room are encouraged to challenge uh, other people. And they're, and they're taught this at a young age. And in the technology units in the military, you know, they know the answer is not at the top. It's most likely in the younger people. And they've kind of diffused that. So ironically, this is an ask for forgiveness culture from where the high tech economy is bred. Um, that's, that's point one, even in the, what I would call the more regulated parts of this economy, building permits, let's just say that, uh, building without a permit is still a well-known phenomenon, uh, in, in the Israeli, uh, economy. And, uh, I think, I think there's, uh, an ethos, candidly one I don't like, um, but it is an ethos of, can I get away with this? And more often than not, because the other part of the Israeli bureaucracy is enforcement is terrible here. And so because of that, I can get away with a lot. So people actually figure out their way around regulation and know they won't get caught. And that breeds an ethos also of rule breaking and then kind of, I wouldn't say asking for forgiveness, but actually pleading for forgiveness and don't find me as much as you really wanted to. And I, I would think I'd be interested in your the arc of your investment career and observer of the Israeli scene, the arrival of millions of people who grew up under a Soviet bureaucracy and had a very uh, dismissive as, uh, attitude toward it must color some of the tech of the attitudes of of, of Israel today. You know, I've, I've talked on the program a little bit. I think about. How, I think Israelis are very patriotic, certainly more patriotic than Americans on average, having just come from America. Uh, but that Russian contingent wasn't very patriotic. I mean, they were not exactly um, – uh, they did not view government as, as their friend, certainly, and rightfully so. And they come here and to Israel, and of, of course, they bring that attitude with them. Is that, do you think that's an, a factor? Is that an issue? I find myself recently distinguishing a lot between uh, the government and state in general. Yep. And I, and I, and I think in, in, in Israel in particular, whether you like the government or don't like the government, you're patriotic to the state and its people. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the miracles of the absorption of, of Russians, of the Russians, the 1 million or so Russians who, who came to Israel is they've been absorbed into the state. And even with some of the, it's not the topic of, of this podcast, some of the kind of, the, you know, the religious or conversion issues that happen in this country, still they've been absorbed in the military. They've been absorbed into society uh, at large, which is what raises uh, the conversion issue at an unbelievable pace. I'll say even more than that, native Israelis had to make a real sacrifice to absorb those 1 million Russian immigrants uh, in that time period. And I think that's a core tenet of Israeli peoplehood is that willingness to sacrifice for a longer term goal. Um, and by the way, economic prosperity, because those 1 million Russians drove a lot of economic prosperity. You should, you should let listeners know. I think there's two great um, secrets about Israel that, that listeners should know. One is we've got about 9 million people here right now. When the Russians came, it was maybe five and a half, 
five and a half. So <laughs> this was a 20 percent increase in population, a group of people coming with basically very little or nothing. A lot of human capital, of course. Uh, Israel immediately became a better uh, chess playing nation, uh, a, a, a Olympic competitor and a whole bunch of things that they hadn't been ex exact necessarily at the, at the top of. I'm sure we had some good chess players before, but it's an enormous amount. A million sounds like a big number. It's a really big number because it's 5 million people who were here before. The other thing you should know about Israel that I think most people don't know is how big it is physically. Uh, I think people think it's well, anyway, it's about the size of New Jersey. It's it's a small place uh, relative to some other places. Very and 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 many of the much of the population lives in, in a handful of places. That's so a, a size. Yeah, but think about this: you have to build twenty percent extra housing in no time, yeah. right? And find jobs for you know one hundred twenty percent of the people that currently have jobs. It's an enormous effort. And of course, the more market economy. The more market-oriented the economy is, the less you'd have to worry about it. But in Israel, there was a lot of top-down uh, activity to to accommodate that that population. They weren't just the markets weren't just allowed to figure that out quote on their own. There was a lot of of government uh, edicts and so on. Um, the other thing we should mention, just to be clear, is again some listeners will know this, but I'm looking at a, at a, a quote. I think maybe I got it from you from your book. Um, so Israel has no natural resources, uh, surrounded by uh, military uh, threats, uh, has to have a very active army as a result. Uh, it says that this quote from the Washington Post. I don't know if it's accurate, but it could be. Produce more startup companies than Japan, India, Korea, Canada, or the United Kingdom. So it's not just when we say, oh, it's pretty successful in the startup world. I think they have more NASDAQ. Here they have more NASDAQ. Com companies than Europe. I don't know if that's true, but the the, the conduit to go back to your earlier point uh, between the military and the startup community is quite extraordinary. It's not just like yeah, they're, they're pretty good at it. It's it's an extraordinary environment. Yeah. By the way, I, I don't know if that's true anymore. It definitely was true three or four years ago. Uh, that quote. Um, there's been an explosion, obviously, in technology companies in, in Europe and India and places like that. And some of them have become more successful in, in IPO to NASDAQ. So I, and I tend not to follow these statistics. They feel like uh, vanity statistics on some level. But yeah. the, the, um, but the trend is, is true. And I, I'd add something else. I think the military piece is, is not just important because you take 18-year-olds and train them at the cutting, cutting edge of technology, which is what, you know, state complexes and militaries have access to. But even, even more importantly, we're forcing kids to sacrifice on behalf of something greater than themselves. And that creates an esprit de corps. That creates uh, patriotism. That creates camaraderie and collaboration that I think is missing in a lot of places. And, uh, and I think it creates a... Um, a unifying force and an empowering force in an economy uh, of mutual responsibility to empower other people to be uh, successful as well. And uh, I think that's really core to the ethos here. It's part of why I'm so bullish on Israel, by the way. So, so a lot of people, of course, romanticize entrepreneurship, and I don't think we do enough of it, to be honest, but we tend to, to romanticize it as a, a, the lone genius, uh, the 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 Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, who you mentioned earlier, you're suggesting with this point about the military that the teamwork aspect of startup life is underappreciated, at least by me, <laughs> and undervalued, and that Israel gets a head start on that because a, a group of friends who have served together in a very demanding environment of military training and, and preparation are then able to take that set of networks, relationships they built with each other and be successful doing something uh, te technical. Is that, is that your argument? Uh, yes. I'll add two other things to that just for a global perspective. Number one, the, the data shows, um, even though the storytelling doesn't, that companies founded by two or more people are more successful than those founded by solo founders. And the reason we forget that is things like Elon Musk or Michael Dell, uh, as an example. But the vast majority of venture-backed companies are founded by by two or more people, and that makes them successful. By the way, even Microsoft, for which Bill Gates is known, he had a co-founder, my Paul Allen. Um, Steve Steve Jobs had a co-founder. Steve Wozniak, Jobs had a yeah. co-founder, Wozniak, yeah. and, and, and Larry and Sergey, right? And so yeah. at, at Google. So um, 
complementarity of, of, of teamwork and collaboration, I think, is a core feature of entrepreneurship, even though it's it's underspoken about. Um, and so, so that's kind of point one. And point two is, I think, as technology becomes more multidisciplinary, which has happened over time, uh, this becomes an even bigger feature um, because you'll, you'll need a mix, whether it's synthetic biology, which is a mixture between biology and digital or cryptocurrency, which requires you uh, to have cryptography backgrounds and networking backgrounds, et cetera. You, you need a mix of skills and therefore having collaboration and years of working together or working across the, the, the table from each other is very valuable. And I, and I like to make the observation that people who like food do not necessarily make good starters of restaurants. And this is so unintuitive to most people because they think, well, the restaurant's about food. Well, actually, it's not. It's about managing people, managing inventory more than anything else, uh, figuring out a way to, to have a decor that attracts people and then training staff to treat people well enough that they want to come be in your business home for anywhere from 20 to 20 minutes to two hours and figuring out how to price things. I mean, it's an enormously complex set of skills and no one person has all those. So the founder of that restaurant is good at one of them. It might be supply and and sourcing and inventory control so that they do that really well and figuring out who to hire for the chef to make it work well. But then they they mess up eight other things, the accounting, the you name it. And they sometimes just run out of money because they can't do everything at once. And a team of people can bring a set of skills. Every business has that demand. And we think of the you know, the tech genius, the coder, the innovator is the, as the, as the centerpiece and they might be, but if they're not surrounded by other pieces, they're not going to make it. It's impossible. You know, it's, it's a variant on the, Oh, I thought of that idea. I thought of an, I thought of the idea of sending photos over the internet. Oh, really? Well, that's a that's worthless. <laughs> the execution is everything. Absolutely. Execution is so underappreciated in the world because we think the world of geniuses, you know, Tim, Tim Cook, for what it's worth, I think has increased the market cap of Apple more than Steve Jobs ever did. And he's a relentless executor. And uh, execution matters a ton. And it's the difference between a good idea and a great company. Yeah, well, that's, yeah that's a good distinction. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the industry you're in of venture capital. Uh, you know, Having spent summers in, in Palo Alto for a long time before I moved here, I had some relationships with VCs there. And I assume you know some of them inevitably by the nature of your work. Do you see a difference in the culture of your industry, not, not the tech part, but just the investing part? Is it different here? Is it, or is it the same? If you had to move to, to California, would you be able to use the same things? I assume you would. Many of the principles are timeless and immortal. Or would, is it, it, what's different about the smallness of the Israeli VC world physically? I mean, it's just in a smaller um, – Silicon Valley is small, but it's surrounded by Austin and Boston and a thousand other places here. It's kind of small. Does it matter? Um, yes and no. So, um, you know, broadly today, there's what I would call two versions of venture capitalism. What I call the venture capital super fund and the cottage industry. Roughly the cottage industry at this point in the history of venture capital is practiced by very few. It's like benchmark and first round capital, I think us at Olive, uh, et cetera. And uh, many others have grown into kind of big money, uh, big purveyors of money uh, and venture capital. It doesn't mean they're not venture capitalists, but these are larger organizations. So I can only speak for our kind of organization. I came from benchmark capital uh, to start Olive, uh, my current fund. And I think roughly they're similar. Uh, in decision making and approach and in, in, in culture, both equal partnerships, um, small, uh, focused, and local. Um, now, there are a couple of very significant differences. Uh, I think if you grow up in Israel in a country of whatever it was, eight, nine, nine and a half million people, your view of large is significantly smaller than someone who grows up in California or Texas, uh, for example. And the venture capital business is driven by outsized large home run, grand slam home run outcomes. And so finding uh, Israelis to be a partner in a fund to have a view of large that's significantly large enough to produce grand slam home run outcomes is actually challenging. Um, if they haven't had exposure to a 350 million person country like America is and know what Texas looks like. And so that's, that's kind of point one. Point two is 
Silicon Valley roughly started 60 years ago at this point. And the Israeli venture scene is 28, 29 years old. And that three decades matters a huge amount for a few reasons. Uh, number one is Israel is getting into what I would call the first generation of scaled up management. Early exits from Israel were small, nobody experienced being at a large company, scaling up, et cetera, in the first decade. In the second decade and a half ish, you started to get scaled up companies out of Israel, Checkpoint, Wix, uh, and a bunch of others. And now you have a cadre of management that has experienced scale that you can start to pepper around. But not having a lot of those companies means we don't have a lot of those managers. And so bringing that talent in to the companies locally is still a challenge. Um, so that's you know, difference two. Uh, difference three is every company in Israel is an export company from day one because nine and a half pe million people is not a market. And so you need to really understand as a venture capitalist here that you can go across, that your entrepreneur can go cross cultural day one, but it also puts an onus on the venture capitalist to help cross that cultural chasm for the entrepreneur because they got to go to another market to sell. This market doesn't produce much anything at nine and a half million people. That's another one. And the last one is, um, you know, everybody, there's not six degrees of separation in Israel. So if in Silicon Valley, it's three degrees of separation. In Israel, there's one degree of separation. You know, I, I can get a reference on an entrepreneur from his kindergarten teacher in one phone call. And so, uh, you know, sifting through that and making it work and having proprietary access to deals because of that is tricky. And uh, we're in a world where there's a lot less proprietary access to deals anywhere at this point. Even in Silicon Valley, everyone's bidding on the same deals right now. Um in Israel, it's a little different. On the one end, there's more proprietary access to deals because of these kind of tight networks, et cetera, and people self-reference. Uh, on the other hand, there's no secrets in this country for real because it's so small and so it's harder to do. Yeah, you and I both uh, have been seen at the Grand Cafe, which is a, a place to eat on uh, Derek B. Lechem. Uh, it's about 15 minutes here from my office. And um, on a typical day, I've been here six months. Talk about six degrees of separation. I've been here six months. Most of the times when I go there, I know a few people there already. They're, and they're not people I knew from America. They're people I've learned, I've gotten to know here. It's a very small world. And you have to talk quietly there because somebody nearby know, is going to either know you or know about you or share something that maybe you don't want shared. So it's it's an awkward Saturday. But I, it's a very pleasant, um, it's a lovely place. I, hey, Russ, because, because my, my main office is in Tel Aviv, but having been at the Grand Cafe, with you and other people and not being able to finish the sentence for people coming over. I literally today just took an office in Jerusalem for the one, one and a half days a week. I'm in Jerusalem. So I get some work done and have quiet meetings. I look for, I, I, do me a favor, get a really good coffee maker there so we can meet there next time. And I'm happy to come see you. Uh, no. A competitor of yours, I will not name, has some good coffee at his place. So, yeah, you know, it's like you said, it's a lot of competition for the deals. Um, Let's um, let's go back to your big uh, observation that you, you sort of introduced this whole conversation with this part of it, and then we're, then we're going to move on. You say you're long on humanity. Uh, it's a grand statement. It sounds nice. Yeah, it's great. What does that really mean in, in practice? I mean, a lot of technology has come along in the last 20 years. It's changed our lives, changed our kids' lives in ways that are, to be honest, something of a mixed bag. I was a huge you know, I talked earlier about the subductive power of storytelling. I, I love technology. I love gadgets. And some of those gadgets that I've come to love, I start to think I'm worrying a little bit whether they're good for me, whether they're good for our democracy. Um, how do you reckon – do you have any of those worries? Or And if you do, how do you reconcile that with the long on humanity part? And how do you think we're going to deal with that? Okay. A um, bit of a complex and longish answer. Uh, so number one, I don't think there's anyone who would really want to trade places with somebody who lived 50 and 100 years ago at this point. So, you know, if a pandemic came you're across- talking to the choir, Michael. You're so okay. talking to the choir, but go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, um, you know, if a pandemic came across, you know, the landscape maybe in, you know, 1918, uh, the odds of getting a vaccine were pretty small, yeah. uh, especially in this short order. And I think in general, the amount of information sharing and what's going on, I just finished- Matt Ridley's amazing book called Viral, Matt Ridley and Alina Chan on the origins of the pandemic, by the way. You see the sleuth work uh, done by Drastic and others on Twitter to kind of uncover the origins of this is stunning. 
uh, stunning. Um, in the past, you know, the cover up of it might might have gotten a lot of easier. And so there are a million things like True. that. And so I don't think you don't want to trade places. That's, that's point one. Point two, anytime we introduce new technology, and it doesn't matter if it's a printing press or anything else, we have perturbations. It's just what happens. Um, and I think we're living through those now. Uh, the watershed moment, as far as I'm concerned, is the introduction of the smartphone, the iPhone For sure. uh, in particular. And uh, it takes time for us to assimilate uh, those technologies. And alongside of that, because of the smartphone, we've also got an acceleration in bots and AI and a million other things. And uh, we weren't ready for it. And we weren't ready for it. And there's no way to slow it down, and it happens. And we shouldn't try to slow it down. But my view is that after that um, comes the humanization of this. How do human beings deal with this? How do we make this better for humanity? And that's the point of my thesis, which is we've gone into a new phase of this, which there'll actually be a lot more computer-to-computer work done. But um, if we can't make it work for humanity, humanity will rebel against it because we've kind of found our footing. And so innovation that will lead the next trillion dollar company will inevitably improve uh, the economic uh, viability, the economic output of humanity, the health of humanity, the well-being of humanity. And that's that's the investment thesis. It's not just optimism. It's also a view of where we are in the in the trend line of technology and these latest generations of it. And for what it's worth, you know, the pandemic has brought to light biosafety. No one was talking about that before, right? And, you know, I've probably seen 10 deals around protecting AI models, you know, and, that, and I think that's all part of it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a pretty, uh, as, as my listeners know, I'm a pretty hardcore free market person, but, but I have been somewhat uneasy about the, the nature of corporate innovation, that that is so that's a little bit unusual. So, part of my, my my the part of me that wants to agree with you is that we figure all this stuff out. We always do. You know, the car comes along, the phone comes along, railroads come along, agriculture. You pick, you name it. Human beings find a way, just like you said, to shape it according to how we think it will serve us best. And it's a decentralized, bottom up process. Um, and through a lot of human history, uh, recent human history, it was somewhat unmitigated by regulation and the rent seeking we we mentioned earlier. The current technology that is revolutionizing revolutionizing our lives that we norm like you mentioned the printing press. It, it it's not so competitive now. It could be that's not important. It could be well. New competitors will come along. We think these giants like Google and Amazon and, and Apple are immortal. They're not. They We thought IBM was immortal. It actually got – it was dethroned. Uh, we thought Microsoft was immortal. It got dethroned. These companies will be dethroned as well, just like you know, people thought Sears Roebuck, Roebuck was going to run the world. Well, they, that was really – they did. people don't understand the power of competition. I worry a little bit about the nature of the competitive process and the sources of the innovation we're talking about and the power of the current network system to, to, that can reduce the ability of competitors to come along and, and dethrone these companies. Now, regulation may help. There may be some changes in property rights and other things that will make this more feasible down the road. But I, I, do you worry about that at all or do you still just kind of I – mean, again, I'm, I'm optimistic like you. I think we should mainly leave them alone, but I'm a little worried that, that it's, this time might be different. Um, it, with your permission, I'll back up. My point is not even a free market point. I think that uh, today, because of technology, business is the best purveyor of positive change in the world, period, full stop. Bold it's statement. Not, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not a free market point per se. It's government right now. Uh, both because of the fractiousness of politics and because its operating system is still the Pony Express, um, can't keep up. And therefore, the friction created by it, not just from an economic perspective, but from a management perspective, 
I mean, so much so you see people like Catherine Boyle and, and, you know, and Andreessen Horowitz. And I don't think this is malicious. I think this is factual saying if we want to kind of rebuild American dynamism, we need it to come from startup entrepreneurs. I don't think that's an accident. Um, I'm sorry. We need more startup entrepreneurs. Yeah, we no. We need we need rebuilding American resilience to come from entrepreneurs. Look, America's in oh. the space race today because of Elon Musk. Period. Full stop. Um, America hasn't delivered a meaningful program like the New Deal or or the Apollo in 50 years. Country's gotten bigger. Government's gotten more out of touch and 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 more overwhelmed by technology. Again, they have an operating system like the Pony Express. So, to the extent that we want resilience and dynamism. And to the extent that we want humanity to get better, we need to rely on entrepreneurship, innovation, and business. Now, um, I think we all have a prevailing sense uh, that I think you're expressing, which is something's still gone wrong, right? And uh, there's abuse of information, abuse of technology, and abuses by business. Uh, at the same time. And people are searching for solutions. So you get things like uh, common good capitalism uh, coming from people, I think it's like Oren Cass or Marco Rubio, um, sub subsidiarity coming from Paul Ryan. Um, and on the other side, you get Bernie Sanders saying, uh, you know, the state will take this over um, or AOC saying we need a green new deal. Um, and candidly, uh, I don't think for the progressives, they stand a chance of having the state doing any of this because it's too unwieldy and operates on the Pony Express operating system. And uh, on the right side, I don't think they found the why. I think they're kind of dancing around for, you know, capitalism is really good. The libertarian approach is, is struggling right now because we're losing large parts of the population. Um, and so we're casting around for new ideas. Some of it cloaked in Christianity, for what it's worth. I think that's the common good capitalism. Um, and so where we are, I think, in 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 uh, the economic cycle right now is we must uh, rely on business uh, and innovation entrepreneurship for advancement, number one. Number two, and this I advocate for in the book, and I, I'm actually slowly putting a manifesto together on the topic with some naming – uh, I think it's better than common good capitalism for what it's worth, that um, we need to align business to empower more people to be successful rather than divide people. And we have a lot of businesses that are misaligned on their business model, and that what needs to be disrupted. Maybe I'll take examples from the portfolio, and you and I have talked about this before because I think it's it's a valuable example. Um I invested in a company called Lemonade, which is an insurance business, fast growing insurance company in the world. Started to call it five and a half or so years ago. Uh, I was fortunate enough to introduce the founders and uh, be around starting the company. Now, by the way, from a regulatory perspective, it was a coin flip whether we'd get a license or someone who would try to block us out of this market, whether it's the regulator or, or other insurance companies. But, you know, Lemonade had a couple of fundamental insights. Uh, number one, uh, brokers. We're incentivized to sell policies, not necessarily to deliver uh, accurate information on the uh, insurees uh, in the process without casting aspersions on them. It's just an incentive system, and incentive systems work. And that's kind of point one. Um, so if you used an app uh, on a phone, you can capture a lot more data about people and get to better underwriting. But number two, fundamentally, the insurance model is broken. Why is it broken? Uh, Dan Ariely is fond of saying that, you know, if you wanted to create uh, a business model brought out the worst in humanity, it looked like insurance. It's really simple. In your time of greatest need, insurance companies are incentivized to reject your claim um, because they make money by rejecting your claim. That's just what it is. The combined ratio is that, right? So, And so um, we ask, could we align the business model? And alignment is really fundamental to a lot of what we're talking about. So Lemonade takes a flat fee from the premiums for running the pool basically and is not incentivized to reject your claim and they'll pay out quickly uh, in order to do that because they want you to be a happy customer and talk about their product. And all we want to do is to get the better and better underwriting. And by the way, leftover premiums go to charity. Now this is not some sort of corporate social responsibility. It's core to the business model because if you know when you file a fraudulent claim, 
that you're really screwing the American Cancer Society, you may want to think twice about it. And so it better aligns all the actors in the system. And I think this creates better long-term growth, which I think is kind of core to some of the questions we're asking ourselves in this current moment in capitalism, which is, one, how do we think more long-term? Two, what sacrifices in the short term are we willing to make to grow the pie for more people and create better alignment in business? We've got this funny situation today where kind of corporate social responsibility has grown. Well, it's grown because people think corporations are terrible. So they kind of create this balancing act. It's like I got the two, two sides of the, of the scale. Okay, I do a lot of crap, so I'll put some some weights on the corporate social responsibility side and it'll even itself out somehow. That's nonsense. And so what we really want to do, and by the way, it comes kind of this dichotomous world, you know, uh, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, or render unto God, which is God. But we don't have to think that way. And I think Jewish thought is not that way for what it's worth. And it's, and we need to get these businesses aligned and we can do this. And, you know, by the way, Israeli kids make a three to seven, eight year sacrifice where they get under market pay for long-term growth of the country and the economy. It's called the military. And the American ethos, which I think most of you has lost that in large measure. And I think that trickles down. That's the core trickle down effect into the economy. So let me, let me disagree a little bit uh, about the, the alignment issue. Cause I, now we've got a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like what you said about incentives, but you said, you sort of said it in, as a throat clearer or sort of an, a parenthetical aside, you said, well, incentives work. And of course that, that really is the, I'd say the most, the simplest insight of economics, not necessarily the most important, but it's, it's, a, it's a simple one. That's, that's quite important. Incentives matter. They're not the, they're, it's not just monetary incentives. It's also, non-monetary incentives like you're referring to about sacrifice or creating something greater than yourself or working with other people. It's not just how rich you're getting up, although that matters. It's not the only thing that matters, though. So incentives matter. And I think the the challenge of some of the things that go wrong in business is that the incentives are not well aligned, as you suggest. But the way we have fixed them traditionally in in the idea of a market system is you don't have to worry about the incentives because they naturally align. They align organically and they align organically through competition. So I, you know, you say business people do some bad things they, they, that are shameful or they're abused, they abuse power. Or the, the, the usual check on that, it could be regulatory. It could be social norms. The third is, of course, you lose your customers. You lose your investors because they're offered a better deal somewhere else by somebody who doesn't abuse them. And so, you know, one of the challenges, I think, of the insurance model that we have, an economist will tell you, it's, we're not going to get into it, but for whatever reason, the insurance model is a regulatory model. And, and the whole, it's structured from the outside, from the top down, not bottom up. We used to have insurance that was different. Maybe it couldn't have survived in the in the reg, in the in a free market way, but it hasn't. For whatever reason, it's it's heavily, in America at least, heavily run, and in Israel, it's I assume heavily run by by government regulation. The prices are set, the certain parameters are set, and those are not allowed to emerge. They're they're decreed, and so I think the challenge. I hadn't really thought about it this way, but the challenge with the current large firms that are successful in America, it gets back to what I suggested earlier, they don't really live in the competitive environment that would normally constrain them. There's some constraints. They don't have, they're not full monopolies. There are other sources. I mean, just to take one example, a lot of the appeal of social media is just entertainment. There are a lot of places you can get entertainment besides flicking through your phone on YouTube or Instagram or whatever. And so they're in a competitive environment. I want to suggest that they, they're in control or they can do whatever they want. They can't. But the nature of competition is different in this world. And I don't think economists have come to grips with it very well. Certainly my friends in the free market community haven't. They, they just sort of assume it'll all work out again like it always has. I like to think that's true. I'm not sure. But if you want to then – if you say – if you're on the left, for sure, and if you're not a free market ideologue, for sure, well, we can't trust competition, capitalists or competition to produce these kind of realignments you're talking about, Michael. It's going to have to be a, a panel of experts or the government or whoever. 
how are you going to get there from here without the corruption of rent seeking and other problems that that me and my free market friends would point out? So, so actually, we agree. Um, the free market argument doesn't apply in an era like banking, insurance, et cetera, where it's already a license and we got to file endless rates and forms. But that's exactly where a better, one of, the, one of the great things about the internet and mobile and getting rid of intermediaries is you can talk directly to customers. So despite starting with a massive disadvantage, Lemonade talks directly to customers. Customers tweet positively about insurance, which you wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, and so you're able to, frictionlessly aggregate uh, customers uh, in that way once you get over the hurdles of getting uh, the license. And so it's not a perfect free market solution, but it is it is better than where we've been in the past uh, in, these, in these industries. And a panel of experts wouldn't solve this. Maybe we've had things run amok in a couple of areas, right? But People have free will to get off Facebook or people have free will to get off Snapchat and people have free will to get all this, you know, Netflix took a beating in the stock market this week, right? Uh, Cause Disney came out with a better product and their content matters and more people going to Disney plus or something like that. And so um, I'm not suggesting that the market will work out all of this. I am suggesting that, um, we're entering a phase where consumers, because they have so much transparency, because there's a lot of friction in the system, we're going into what I would call a very uncertain time for a lot of these things where we can see a lot of change driven by this technology and we need to let it unfold. And I think we are seeing more and more entrepreneurs who are the drivers of those change care about the thesis I articulate as long humanity empowerment. And you look at things like... Um, uh, and Della, right? A company that takes African programmers and makes them available to U.S. companies. It's pretty stunning. So business couldn't have exist, you know. And who would roll out of bed one day and say, oh, let's improve the lot of more people living in Africa and get them U.S. salaries for this? Um, amazing. No panel of experts would have come up with that. Um, let's get us into space faster, cheaper, better. Uh, no panel of experts did come up with that uh, for what it's worth. Uh how do we get a vaccine out quickly to fight this pandemic? Not a panel of experts. And so, you know, people want to work on these hard problems. And more and more, I see engineers who want to work on these hard humanity problems. So I think we're going to get there. Um, and you also have like little nascent initiatives like Eric Rice's long-term stock exchange. You know, part of the pressure of quarterly earnings right now is exactly that. We're, we're, we're asking people to make you know, short-term decisions. I'm sure the SEC thinks it's a really great idea for transparency. At the end of the day, uh, I'm not certain it's a great idea. And it takes a unique guy like Bezos to kind of say, you know, I don't care what you think about the quarter. I'm going for the long term. You built a behemoth doing it. Um, and so uh, I think we're headed in the right direction, but we need to coalesce this around a framework um, that, that explains the short-term costs and long-term benefits uh, to, to growing the pie and the prosperity of doing this and to get people to act a little less like individual actors and more like empowering actors. And, you know, to, to change a little bit up on Adam Smith here, I, I know he thinks that the baker doing the baker's job and the cobbler doing the cobbler's job will make the whole thing work. What I argue is uh, the baker doing the baker's job and enabling three other bakers to do the baker's job very successfully is more effective in growing the pie. And, if we can help people understand that when the pie grows, we all win, uh, we can do that. Now, again, I, I think a lot of that's cultural. Um, and it's an ethos that exists here in Israel. It's, again, why I'm so bullish on it. So that's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I've often longed for the idea that um, cultural norms, social norms, and ethos would solve our, some of our problems and that we would use – non-governmental solutions like shame and other things to um, incentivize people to, quote, do the right thing. In fact, you know, I haven't we've talked about this episode in a long time, but about 100 years ago in the early days of Econ Talk, probably was 2007 or 8, I can't remember, but I had Paul Buckeye on, and Paul was the lead person on uh, Gmail. And 
you know, I came to Shalem College uh, a few months ago, and my whole staff uses Outlook. And I hate Outlook. <laughs> I can't stand it. But I'm, you know, hey, I'm a new president. I got <laughs> can't really tell my staff this is a big mistake. <laughs> you know, we're going to stick. So we're sticking with Outlook, you know, right now, right now. But Gmail is much better. It's really a lot better. It's a phenomenal. I love Gmail. Many, many things I like about it, especially after I started using Outlook. Uh, but when I talked to Paul, and it's again a long time ago, different time. You know, I asked him what constrains Google from not abusing the power that a lot of people have migrated. Not everybody. You know, like you say, we're free not to use it. There are wonderful options uh, that are out there. I think it's called Proton. I tried that for a while and other things that are much more decentralized, less profit-oriented. I said, well, what, what keeps um, you know Google from abusing its incredible base of and information it has access to that I'm happy to give most of the time. I don't think about it. And he actually, I think he said to me that their motto is don't be evil. And I think I laughed out loud. I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm not proud of it, but I'm pretty sure if we go back and listen to the tape, that, you know, that's really not usually what restrains people uh, is the motto. It's the incentives. So if those incentives don't change, I, I, your vision of a, a business ethos that empowers humanity isn't going to change, I don't think. So um, part of changing incentives is changing metrics. Um, and so I, I'm hard at work now actually on trying to build a set of metrics uh, around this. Um when we're not on econ talk, I'll 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 check your economist head because I barely have a degree in anything. Um, but I think what we measure matters uh, over time. Um, and so uh, I did a project at the beginning of Corona around economic resilience uh, in Israel, where we created a new me metric of household economic resilience. And some of the government will go, "Oh, that's really interesting. How come no one thought about that before?" You know, the OECD. One of my least favorite organizations on the planet because I think they measure all the wrong things. Um, GDP, which is a terrible measurement of economic output today and 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 human resilience. Uh, and they, I, I always want to be clear. This, I, I'm talking about making more money now. I'm not talking about like some nary fairy, you know, communitarian approach. I'm talking about improving economic prosperity, and you got to measure the right things to improve uh, economic uh, prosperity. And um, your point about Google is important, but it's also important to understand the structure of the industry. Ben, ben Thompson is, has put this front and center. The government's after all the wrong things, so they'll never be able to regulate it. So important. When you have a frictionless system uh, like the Internet, um, he who controls the demand controls everything. And the way you control demand, by the way, is not through monopolistic power today. It's by creating the best user experience. You said it yourself. I use Gmail because the best user experience. I stay on Instagram. I, I don't have an Instagram account for what it's worth. I've never been on it. But people stay on Instagram because it's a great user experience. Um, WhatsApp's not that popular in the U.S. because iMessage kind of works and people's friends have iMessage. But it's a great user experience, you know, here in Arizona and across the world. And so the government actually can't regulate that problem of great user experiences. And so we need to talk about the values and the competition. And if you think Google is evil or abusing their power, so say so and stand up and explain the actual costs of doing that. You know, funnily, when, when, when we started Lemonade, I, I asked the question, why do people buy from State Farm today? You know what the answer is? Because their father bought from State Farm. And so Maybe. the convenience of having the local agent who's a State Farm agent um, is what did it before. The convenience of a great user experience on Google is the same. So we've got a lot of things that look like this. The prior economy, we just don't think about it in the same way. So um, Ben Thompson's talked about aggregation theory, which is if I have the most frictionless user experience, I, I aggregate the users. And then we need to move the users off. And so you can move the user off through better experiences. You can move the users off by enabling portability. Um, so can I port my social graph off of Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is? Um, we can do that. No one's talking about it for what it's worth in Congress. Um, so we're not going to get there. And so um, we need to look at these things in the context in which they're created. Nobody ever said, fire, shoot the State Farm agent 
because he sold multi-generational policies to people, even though he had capture. And we may not be good for the customer. And we shouldn't have said that, by the way, to be clear. Um, and we shouldn't do the same, I think, to Google. We, 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 we should enable, though, freedom. So I should be able to port my graph to get out of there. When you say, uh, when you say port your graph, what do you mean? So right now, my social graph on, for example, Facebook or WhatsApp belongs to Facebook. When you say graph, though, what do you mean? Who I'm connected to, my friends. Why do I stay there? I stay on Facebook because of great user experience because my friends are there, right? I'm not that active on Facebook, but whatever. You get the point. Um, if that was portable and I could take it to a different application, it belonged to me, uh, you know, that would matter. For what, for what it's worth, by the way, some of the promise of Web3 and crypto is exactly that. It's an interesting question whether it's actually accurate um, because, like, for example, I mean, this is really getting into the weeds, but, you know, OpenSea, which is the leading platform for NFTs, deplatformed a couple NFTs recently. And so there is still platforming there. So there's a question whether Web3 in promise and reality is really the same and crypto really enables me to own my data on my graph. But at least theoretically, that's one of the solutions of, of, of uh, the blockchain and, and, and Web3. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, that's the, I think that's the, in a way, it's a tiny change. It's a, it's a property rights change, right? It, it, it says, I have X thousand followers on Twitter. A Twitter competitor comes along. It's better for what, in whatever way, don't know, but don't specify it. Let's say I want it. I want to be on there rather than being on Twitter. It's true that I won't get to enjoy the stream of people on Twitter that that I can get now because it has so many users I'm interested in. But the other side is that my ability to reach the people who are interested in me disappears as soon as I go to this new platform and I've got to recreate my follower base. And not only is that going to be hard because they don't know I'm on the new platform, they're not on the new platform yet because they are stuck and happy or not, doesn't matter, on Twitter. So obviously, if there was a way to say, hey, folks, I'm on Twitter and you are you can follow me there just as easily, I could port them, as you say, take my followers with me, take my tweets with me, by the way, which you could argue are mine, but right now they're not, they're Twitters, can't take them at all. I can copy and paste them one at a time. And, and my dream has been from the beginning, and I think we're close with the Web3 thing and the blockchain, although I haven't followed it closely. My dream from the beginning is a network, a social network company will start that says, we will let you port your stuff. That's competition. We're better than the places you've been hanging out with your friends because we'll let you take them with you if we don't do a good job. So come try us. Maybe we'll even pay you for a while to come because we understand you've got all this advantage at those old places. So I do think that is the preferred method to cope with this. I don't think that's the way we're going to head, but we could. It could It could work out that way. Yeah, you know, it's not the same as local number portability, which you just take your phone number with you. It's more complex than that, obviously. Yeah, much more complex than that. But it's, uh, you know, whether we get there or not, I don't know. My, my point is that we need to contend with it on its own terms because the internet is different than the rest of the economic system we have. And again, part of the problem is just in these government interactions with Facebook, you know, they don't know the material. And so I don't expect them to come to a good solution. Um, hopefully they'll learn it sooner rather than later. But what I do is I, I sit down and encourage entrepreneurs all day, you know, go compete with LinkedIn on different terms, go compete with Twitter on different terms, go and, uh, you know, make it more human first. I think ultimately human beings want to be treated like, you know, subjects and not objects. And, uh, you know, that's part of a good story too. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. Well, we're, we're, over an hour here, enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, but we didn't talk at all about the uh, the Bible side of your book, so I want to give you a chance to to, to plug it. The book is an interesting um, interesting approach to both the Bible and to economics. It it notices, which I think is is extraordinary, how much economics, and, I, and by that I don't mean my kind of economics of rational choice, emergent order, that kind of stuff, but more like the business side of life. Economics is in the financial side, the way it's often – sometimes the word's misused, but it's the way people use it often. You know, Joseph, Jacob and his and his family are a family business. Uh, we tend to think of it as a bunch of sibling rivalry, but as you suggest in the book, 
a lot of that sibling rivalry was was financial. It was material. It wasn't. Uh, it was. It was. It was. A, it was a family business. Joseph's um, extraordinary experience in Egypt, empowering Pharaoh during a time of famine to survive it and then become even more powerful than before with political power and economic power is an important part of that story. I think most people would know that. They say it in passing, but you put it front and center. Uh, so I want to give you a chance just to, before we close, talk about why somebody who doesn't believe in God and is not a religious person, Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, why they should read the Hebrew Scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the book of Genesis. You're planning a set of commentaries on each book of the of the Torah, the the Hebrew Bible. And this first one's on Genesis, which has a lot of interesting interpersonal stuff, but as I said, a lot of financial stuff. Uh, why, why should I read that? Uh, why should I read the Bible? We'll have to, by the way, do another hour because... I was going to say, yeah, on one foot. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll have to do another hour because both on the book, and we didn't get to talk about the geopolitics you want to talk about or my views are yeah. risky and uncertainty. We'll have to get that another time. But um, So this is uh, the first of a quintology um, on the Bible, the the first three books have actually come out in, in, in Hebrew already, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and the fourth one on Numbers is due out in uh, in April uh, in Hebrew. And to your point, the Tree of Life and Prosperity uh, is out in English now uh, for about five months. And in fact, a large percentage of the audience that's gotten the book are investors, entrepreneurs, and technologists and who have purchased it. Uh, I just got a note today from a investment bank that they're purchasing 200 books for their private wealth conference. Um, and they want to know if I'd sign them and they don't know who the audience is. So let's go straight to your question of why someone who's not necessarily God a believer, uh, should buy the book. And so I say three things. Number one is the Bible, the Hebrew Bible has stood the test of time for 5,000 years. It's probably has the most unique users of anything on the planet, even more than Google. <laughs> and and uh, I think principles and narratives that stand the test of time probably have a lot to offer us uh, as people. Number two, when I released the book in Hebrew, uh, a local rabbi, Rabbi Benny Lau, who wrote a forward to another of my books, said, you know what I learned from your book? People haven't changed in 3,000, 4,000 years. And the kind of struggles of, of Adam in the Garden of Eden uh, with universal basic income. Uh, as I call it there, or or Noah and his innovation of the plow and, and Alfred Nobel, uh, or Abraham and how he deals with wealth in society or negotiates a business deal or or, or Jacob and the family business. And, and I go on uh, in transitions and generations like we talked about before between agrarian societies and shepherding societies or industrial societies and technology societies. These are enduring principles and people are people. And so there is a lot to learn uh, from these interactions and, and how we um, uh, translate them into a modern context. And that's the third point, which is we're in a very fast moving world right now from a technological and economic perspective. Um, and we think like every day we're a lot smarter than the people who came before us, which may or may not be true. And, but what we're missing is a translation layer from what Balaji Srinivasan called, uh, reference to my book, Wisdom of the Ancients for Moderns. It's not just the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot of smart insights of people who've come before us that if we can just translate their wisdom into modern times, we can deal with a lot of the challenges you were talking about uh, earlier. And so... The book has found an audience, by the way, for what it's worth, I think mostly with non-believers rather than believers who are kind of shocked. No one ever talked to me about the Bible that way, uh, the Hebrew Bible, and no one ever talked to me about the economy that way. And it's been extremely gratifying. I hope it's launched a conversation. Um, and as the book series evolves, because I've gotten feedback, I, I hope it's getting sharper uh, as time goes on. And like I said, I'm in the middle of writing a manifesto right now, kind of uh, – on this topic, I'm attempting to define uh, different models of capitalism as we go forward into the third decade of the 21st century, uh, especially after we've had two decades of free money 
uh, in the market and uh, um, what that's kind of wrought with American capitalism in particular. And at the same time, we have a Chinese kind of form of an economy that we can no longer call socialism. Um, it's a, a, some other form of capitalism. And I'm going to attempt to articulate a third way forward uh, from that. And uh, a lot of it is drawn from biblical understandings of an economic reality I think is equally as applicable today. Well, I look forward to having you back. We can talk about it. My guest today has been Michael Eisenberg. His, uh, his book is The Tree of Life and Prosperity. Michael, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This was super. Yeah, it was a blast. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.